from the very wet times of southern New Jersey, this is Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters, and today is Monday. It's October the 7th, 2013. Hope you had a great weekend. And no doubt it'll be another wild week. Never boring. The uh, government is still shut down here in the good old U.S. of A. as both sides have firmly dug in with no end in sight. And the October 17th uh, deadline uh, is just 10 days away, and that's the deadline when the government will run out of borrowed money unless the debt ceiling is raised again. So it's times like this that we need to remember to breathe as well as lighten up and have a good laugh and to remember the many, many talented people of our past for whom our world is brighter, and more alive for them having been here. So that's why in recent weeks we've done um, several entertainment-themed programs here on Far Out Radio. And uh, remember that sweet old tune from Monty Python, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. Now you've got the earworm, too. We have a new guest for you this evening. Mel Simons is an entertainer, a comedian, an author, and he plays the accordion. Mel has 10 books published by Bear Manor Media, and his latest book is titled The Old Time Radio Trivia Book 2. Mel is with us this evening to talk about his career in the kind of entertainment that makes people laugh, puts them in a good mood, and salutes some of the greats of entertainment, entertainment's past. From radio to television to movies to music and jokes, Mel's books and performances are sure to delight. Hi, Mel. Welcome to the program. Hi, Scott. Great to be with you. So, what's one of your favorite jokes of late, since, since humor is your business? <laughs> I tell you, Scott, I have so many. How about, how about uh, President Obama visiting a nursing home Walking okay. around, meeting and greeting the people, and he saw one little lady sitting all by herself in the corner. So the president walked over to her, and he bent down, and he said to her, Do you know who I am? And she looked up, and she said, Well, if you go to the front desk, they'll tell you. <laughs> Cute stuff. Very nice. Very nice. So how long have you been at this, Mel? Well, I've been entertaining my whole life. And then, uh, you know, uh, by entertaining, I do stand-up comedy. I'm an accordionist. But I've always wanted to do um, lectures, uh, primarily on old-time radio. And I started that several years ago. It all started from a hobby. For years, I've collected old radio shows. And I developed this show called um, The Golden Days of Radio. And uh, I, 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 I've had much success with that. I travel all over... Uh, New England and New York doing that show, and it was uh, it was suggested to me that my great love for old time radio that I do a book. So a few years ago, I uh, took the hobby and I, dev- I I made it into a book called the Old Time Radio Trivia Book, which is now mushroomed into ten different books. The books are on old time radio, old time television, movies, good music. Um, and the new book, which you were very kind to mention, is called The Old Time Radio Trivia Book Part 2. Wow. Now, I was when I was reading through your website here, it, it mentioned that you have a, a collection of sounds. Mm-hmm. Tell, us, tell us about that, and, and how, how have you been collecting these records? Uh... I've always been a collector. I go to flea markets. I go to yard sales, garage sales, and... Um, I not only collect old radio shows, but I, I like to find things by people singing that are not known as singers. Uh, for example, I'll come up with things like uh, Betty Davis singing, uh, Humphrey Bogart singing, Cary Grant singing. And I have a lot of fun with these voices on uh, WBZ Radio here in Boston. And it's a quiz I've done for many, many years on the station. I call it trivia without the questions. I play voices, and the people have got to call up and guess the voice. And for some of the toughies, like these people singing who are not known as singers, we give away BZ pins. And that's what I've been doing for years on uh, on WBZ Radio. Nice. You know, when you describe that, it made me remember that uh, back in the old days of the studio system, um, talent was oftentimes, uh, I don't know, sort of taken, sent off to uh, finishing school, and they taught them how to dance. 
and how to present themselves and how to, you know, which fork and spoon to pick up when they're at a fine restaurant. And they also taught some of them how to sing. It didn't necessarily mean they sang well, but because a lot of times they had roles and they had to sing. Um, are you talking about, uh, you know, who taught me? Is that basically what you're saying? Oh, it's, it's just, I, don't quite you know, I, had, I had never really thought about, um, you know, uh, sing, songs sung by act famous actors, like, like you mentioned Betty Davis and Cary Grant. Mm -hmm. But indeed, when you watch a lot of those old films, there they are singing. Oh, exactly. Yeah, most of them, uh, Scott, do come from old movies unusual people singing, and I'm constantly hunting these things out. Uh, another fun thing that I love to do uh, is play uh, theme songs of TV shows, of movies, of radio shows, and people have got to, uh, to guess the theme. And uh, another thing that I, I enjoy doing is taking old singing commercials, the original jingles, and uh, buzzing out the product for example, it would come out on radio like this. The actual commercial. You'll wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with, uh, <laughs> and I buzz out Pepsodent. And people call up and guess mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the commercial. So it's a lot of fun. I, re I remember that one. <laughs> sure. Oh, the old singing jingles, there were many of them. I've often wondered why uh, many of the sponsors don't come up with new ones. They were so entertaining. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a it's a funny thing because you don't, you know, you know, life goes on and that stuff sort of fades into the past and you kind of forget about them until you happen to hear one. Well, that's it. it. I'm a kind of a one man show to keep this stuff alive. Good for you, Mel. Good for you. Huh? Uh, you were talking about uh, actors singing. I I remember when. Do you have part as part of your collection uh, the time Clint Eastwood tried to sing in Paint Your Wagon? Yeah. Pretty bad, wasn't it? Yeah, it was pretty bad. Yeah, yeah most yeah. of the singers, uh, no, most of the actors, rather, that have tried singing have not been too good. And Clint Eastwood was one of the real bad ones. <laughs> yes, I know really just was. what you're referring to, yeah. From that movie, Paint Your, from the movie version of Paint Your Wagon. Exactly. Uh, and I think I've seen uh, uh, a couple of um, Sean Connery efforts that were, don't do that, Sean. <laughs> Sean sang in a Disney movie, and I can't remember the movie, but he was acceptable. I'm, try I'm being kind. I'm being yeah. kind. He was just okay. Just okay. Not terrific. Some of the singers are not bad. Tell you who's not bad. Julie, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Did you ever hear, hear her sing? No. You know, from Seinfeld. She's a very good singer. Well, no, I, I hate to admit this, but I don't watch much television at all, and mm -hmm. uh, I have never seen a complete episode of Seinfeld. Well, I... I'm not a big TV watcher either, <laughs> Scott, but that is uh, that, that was one of the biggies that I always did watch, one of the few me? shows I've caught over the years. Uh, I like I've... you. I also, I only ever saw one episode of MASH. Sorry. It was the very last episode, and I, the only reason I watched it was because uh, I knew it was going to be the last episode, and I thought, you know, I've never seen this. You know, it's you know, just always busy, so I wanted to watch I, the very last one. Yeah, I'm just like you. I had never watched MASH either, but it got so much hype being the last show of the series that I watched it, and I just uh, I just couldn't get into it because I didn't know that much about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and I also never saw a complete episode of Cheers. Sorry, Cheers fans, but <laughs> no, me, no, I, I've never watched Cheers either. The only two shows really that I've been addicted to in recent years were um, Seinfeld and All in the Family. Oh, yeah, I was. You're reading my mind. I was thinking of All in the Family, with uh, uh, with Archie and Edith singing that wonderful song in the beginning. Boy, the way Glenn Miller played, yeah, songs yeah. that made the hit parade. You know what I used to do with that show? It was before video recorders uh, came out on the market. I used to audio record it most Saturday nights, uh, I, I work nights for me, and I would set a timer to record the audio version of All in the Family. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get home one, two o'clock in the morning from a gig, and uh, I play the audio version. Neat. Which I, I loved. Remember, 
Speaking of singing and Archie and Edith, I remember one time, I watched, that was one of the few comedy shows that I, I watched all the time, but Edith was singing, I think she was doing her house cleaning and she was singing and it was really bad. And Archie says, Edith, stop that. You sing like chalk on a blackboard there, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and she did. Great show. Wonderful stuff. Yeah. All right, we're going to, uh, we have our music playing and we're going to take our break and we'll be back in just a few minutes. If you're just joining us, entertainer and comedian Mel Simons is, the, is with us this evening. He's the author of 10 books on uh, entertainment trivia and we'll be back in just a few minutes. And we are back and if you're just joining us, our guest this evening is entertainer and comedian Mel Simons, he's the author of many books, ten books actually, on the topics of old-time radio, television, and uh, uh, movie entertainment. His latest book is titled Old-Time Radio Trivia 2, and all of Mel's books are available at Bear Manor Media, that's B-E-A-R, mannermedia.com, and you can keep up with Mel's work and his appearance schedule by visiting his website, melsimons.net. Mel, during the uh, commercial break, I was thinking about the the opposite of what we were poking some fun at at actors who didn't sing so good. And I was thinking about singers who became actors, and some of them were pretty good, and others were just awful. <laughs> oh, it, it, it's very true. It's funny when I play voices of some of the uh, actors singing, some are so obvious, and some sound nothing like their speaking voice. So it really varies from person to person. But I do have a lot of fun with the the uh, unusual people singing, you know, trying to stump the audience. Now, who would uh, – what what singer or what act, singer-actor would you be referring to there? That didn't, About what? Their, sing, their singing voice didn't sound like what you would imagine it was. Would oh, be. boy. Jerry Seinfeld. Okay. Sounds nothing singing the way he would uh, – the way you would picture him. William Bendix, I've played him singing, quite different from his speaking voice. Then there are other singers where the reverse, the uh, the drunk uh, the drunk comedian um, having a oh, Foster Brooks. Foster Brooks, let me let me tell you something, Scott. This guy is so magnificent as a singer. He has an operatic voice. Mm-hmm. That even if he did not do that silly, you know, drunk bit that he did, he he would have made it as a singer. He absolutely knocks me out as a singer. I play him every once in a while, and he's the best. He had an amazing, amazing voice, and it was it, it, it kind of fooled you very much like um, uh, Jim Neighbors voice. Yeah, he made, he made his career out of being Gomer Pyle. Exactly. When he sings, it's nothing like that. You know, golly character. <laughs> and Neighbors is a, tra- is a trained singer. He's very, very good. Yeah, that, that Shazam routine and that uh, uh, surprise, surprise, surprise. Yep, <laughs> and doesn't come through when he sings. No, not at all. Beautiful. Yeah. And then I was thinking about some some people who are primarily uh, singers who uh, occasionally turn to some outstanding acting performances. I'm thinking of Bing Crosby and some of his dramatic roles. Uh, uh, Fred Astaire was pretty darn good. Frank Sinatra could be astonishing in some of his acting roles. Oh, Um, sure. It's it's funny you should mention those because both Crosby and Sinatra are Academy Award winners. Right. For, yeah. for acting, uh, Sinatra was from here to eternity, and Bing, where he played a priest in Going My Way. Yeah. Terrific acting jobs. I don't remember the name of the movie that Bing was in, but he it was a western, and he was very he wore a like black tails and a top, and he was just very very dirty and scruffy. Uh, but he was really really good in that. Oh, I'm not surprised because a good actor could play any role, from heavy drama to comedy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I I have a peripheral interest in uh, what I guess you call classic country music, and here and there I've seen um, uh, country and western uh, legends such as uh, Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson uh, yeah. turn in some very very good roles. But with Johnny, it always had to be a western. Well, that 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 was kind of his bag, yeah. and I understand that Willie Nelson has a new album coming out next week. Uh, it's kind of a duet type thing where he sings with other famous people, and I'm a, I'm a big Willie Nelson fan. I'll I'll be amongst the first to get that CD. 
it took me a long, long time to get Willie Nelson. Really? Yeah, I don't know why. It just Mm -hmm. um, uh, many years ago, uh, I bought his uh, Stardust album, and I didn't really know what what I was buying. Uh, You know, it's you know a beautiful collection of uh, old standards. Sure. And uh, when it came out, I played it a couple of times. And I, just, I didn't like it. Not your and turn. then uh, sometime over the last year or so, I happened to stumble upon uh, uh, many tracks from that album. And you know, now that I appreciate Willie and kind of get him, uh, it's just some of my favorite music. Oh yeah, me me too, Scott. I I love Willie Nelson as a performer, and uh, I, I've enjoyed everything, especially when he sings songs from the Great American Songbook. Mm-hmm. And I look forward to this new CD that'll be out. I think the 15th is the uh, release date. Well, our Willie Nelson fans have something to look forward to. Absolutely. And he always has that piece of junk guitar that he plays. It sounds great. But every yeah. time I see that guitar, it keeps, like like Willie, it looks a little worse. I, I yeah. know. I, well, he, he doesn't look so hot either these days, you know, <laughs> uh, being a pot smoker most of his life. And uh, Willie is now in his 80s. But let me tell you, he plays a darn good guitar. Oh, he's amazing. And, and when you hear him sing, the guitar accompaniment in the background is is him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's really quite amazing stuff. Now, you and I were talking last week about this this concept of the theater of the mind, mm-hmm. uh, and and the storytelling aspect of of old time radio, and just what a it, it's almost kind of a lost thing these days, isn't it? Well, it really is. Unfortunately, youngsters have no idea. And um, I, I, uh, I, I love when there's youngsters in the audience when I do my old-time radio show. What, what I do basically is play excerpts of radio shows, but I embellish it with little stories about some of these performers. And I explain to, uh, to the youngsters who are in the audience that it was before television, although it did, did overlap radio and television, and there was nothing to see. So consequently, you you used your imagination, the mind, your imagination was your picture tube. Radio was the theater of the mind, and you visualized everything. Could be five different people listening to the same show. You visualized it in your own in your own personal way. It was a wonderful media. Yeah, it really was. I got I got a little tiny taste of that back in the late sixties. One of the uh, the AM radio stations uh, in the greater Philadelphia area was uh, WIP. It's still out there, but it's, I think it's Sports Talk Radio now. But it was sort of a middle-of-the-road uh, kind of a station. And uh, uh, back in the late 60s, uh, occasionally on Friday nights, they would play old-time radio shows. And I remember my mom and I just thoroughly enjoying the Bickersons. Oh, the Bickersons were hysterical. Yes. Uh, they both played off each other, and it was one of the great comedies on radio, Francis Langford and uh, Donna Mitri. Yeah. Fabulous. It was sort of, sort of a proto- early prototype uh, version of All in the Family. Yes, exactly. Where there was no comedian, they all played off each other. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I got it instantly, and, uh, you know, my mom told me that... Uh, it was nothing quite like being with the family gathered around the radio. It was sort of the fireplace hearth in the uh, yeah. in the house. It was really amazing. Radio was a real oh, so. family. Now we're going to take our. Yeah, it really was. Now we're going to take our break, and uh, we'll sure. be right back. Okay. Our guest this evening is entertainer and comedian. Mel Simons. He's the author of many books, 10 books actually, on the topics of old time radio, old time television, and movie entertainment. And his latest book is titled Old Time Radio Trivia Book 2. All of Mel's books are available at Bear Manor Media, and Bear is spelled B E A R. And you can keep up with Mel's work and his appearance schedule throughout the New England area by visiting his website, melsimons.net. Now, I see on your on your website here that you have something called a one-man show, The Life and Songs of Al Jolson, Jimmy Durante, Eddie Cantor, and George M. Cohen. It jumped out at me because just last Friday night, my, my guest was Brian Gary, who was, or his grandfather was Eddie Cantor. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Cantor was one of the great entertainers. What I wanted to do... Uh, what I wanted to do, Scott, is something different. So I, d- I decided to take these four legends 
and develop a one-man show. And I do three things in this show. I play their voices, not from uh, phonograph records, but from my collection of old radio shows. Secondly, I tell little inside showbiz stories about these four personalities. And third, with my accordion, I do a lot of audience participation, and I get the audience involved with the great songs that the four of them made famous. And I constantly intertwine those three things, and it's become one of my most most popular shows. Hmm. And I love to do it. That sounds really neat. Now, for our list, our younger listeners that might not know, well, so who's Al Jolson and Jimmy Durante and Eddie Cantor and George M. Cohen? What would be some songs that, or what are some of the songs that you feature in that program? Well, with Cohen, there's um, Your Grand Old Flag, Yankee Doodle Dandy, Harrigan. With Durante, I, uh, I do his famous closing song, Good Night, Good Night, Good Night, and they'd say, Good Night, Mrs. Calabash, wherever you are. With uh, Cantor, his, some of his great songs were If You Knew Susie, Ida, How Are You Going to Keep Him Down on the Farm, and with Jolson, who was, uh, well, the best way I can describe it, he was the Bruce Springsteen of his era. There were so many fabulous songs that Jolie had, like April Showers, rock by your Baby with a Dixie Melody, Mammy, and on and on the, the great Jolson songs came. Uh, last weekend, well, a few weeks ago, let me back up a little bit, uh, one of the other Bear Manor Media authors uh, is a very nice fellow named uh, Bruce Torrance, who wrote uh, his most recent book is titled Hollywood Canteen. And it's a, it's a photo, go, photo book, and it's, a, it's about the Hollywood canteen there in Hollywood um, for the uh, GIs during World War II. Sure. And um, um, after going through the book, I realized I've, I never saw the movie. You know? Oh, it was a very popular movie back in the mid-40s. And all the major stars, especially the actresses, would frequent uh, the Hollywood canteen and entertain the uh, soldiers, the sailors. All, all the uh, fighting men. It was a very, very popular movie in its time. Well, I, I realized I had never seen the movie, uh, but we do have a subscription to Netflix. And I looked it up, and sure enough, the disc was available on Netflix. And we got it uh, the weekend before last, and we're just, well, totally entertained and, and delighted. It was just a very, very sweet story about the millionth soldier to go through the uh, Hollywood canteen and uh, and uh, many of these people. Well, uh, Eddie Cantor was uh, was in That's the movie, right. and uh, and I all the think, well in the book. I saw pictures of yeah anybody who was anybody in Hollywood wanted exactly. to be a part of that, and it was uh, it was really a, a special thing. But I got to tell you, uh, Mel, what really blew me away was those actresses and the hostesses. You know the 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 gals who worked at the studio, maybe mm-hmm. as secretaries or whatever. They were so beautiful. You know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And they would dance with the with the servicemen, and they would serve them food and drinks any way that they could be of help to our fighting men. Mm-hmm. They were there. And looking at these at these beautiful young women, uh, I'm looking at them, and with the full realization that. Uh, they were born that way. Okay, I realized they're wearing makeup, but you know, there were there were no chin implants, there was no oh, Botox yeah. or nips and tucks yeah, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Uh, no, they were just they were just that gorgeous. They really yeah, it's, were it's a different era today. It really is. Mm-hmm. But they they were super classic movie, Scott. I knew you'd enjoy it. Uh, yeah, I, we really did. And the the, uh, the DVD had a, a whole bunch of uh, uh, special features that were uh, just as entertaining as the movie. It was really absolutely really sweet. Sure. I'm I'm kind of on a roll now with this nostalgia stuff after after uh, getting tuned into uh, the, the various authors like yourself from uh, Bear Manor Media. Uh, Bear Manor Bear Manor is terrific. They are just terrific people, and it's a whole different concept with nostalgia. And uh, I just couldn't be more pleased with the company. They have treated me very, very well. Let me ask you a question, Scott. Any sure. favorite radio shows that you personally have listened to that you enjoy? Contemporary ones? Well, anything, past or present. 
Um, I was thinking I was telling you a couple of weeks ago when we were talking that uh, back in back on Halloween, around Halloween of 1969, that local radio station WIP uh, played the um, it was the 30th anniversary of the broadcast of Orson Welles' yeah. War of the Worlds. Yeah. And they, they played the whole thing. And uh, my mom was especially excited about that uh, being broadcast because she remembered hearing it live. Oh, sure. And, and she told me a, a very charming uh, sort of a setup story about it. Um, you know, like like a lot of people, they, they love to listen to the programs. And uh, somebody turned it on and uh, started listening to it. And my, my grandfather said, what's that? And my my uncle Frank went over to the newspaper and he opened up the newspaper in the entertainment section and you know, there was a listing of all the radio programs, the stations, and then the shows, uh, you know, by time so you could, you know, find out what's going to be on what station. And my uncle Frank looked it up. He says, "Oh, it's War of the Worlds with Orson Welles." And they said, "Oh, okay, fine." So they sat there and they watched it, unbeknownst to them, until a couple days later. Their next door neighbor didn't realize that it was a radio program, and this poor man completely panicked and freaked out. Sure. Gathered up his family and they 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 jumped in the car and they went tearing across the old Taconia Palmyra Bridge. Mm-hmm. Got to the other side to the gas station, you know. Told the guy, "Fill her up, you know. We got to run. The Martians are here." And the gas station attendant said, "That's a radio program, sir." <laughs> Isn't that an amazing story? I'll, I'll comment on that after your, your commercial. Very good, yes. We're going to take our break as we uh, roll into a last segment with our guest, Sidney Mel Simons, and uh, we'll be right back in just a few minutes. segment this evening with uh, our guest Mel Simons and uh, he's an entertainer, a comedian, a prolific author in the arena of uh, old time vintage entertainment be it uh, music, old time radio, television, movies uh, he's got quite a collection of books 10 books uh, all together available at bearmanormedia.com and you can keep up with Mel's work and his appearance schedule at his website melsimons.net Mel, I was just looking at your at your schedule Wow, don't you ever take any time off? <laughs> you know, I tell you, Scott, I love, I love what I do. I and, can tell. <laughs> and, and, and to do what I do and get paid for doing what I probably do for nothing if I didn't get paid. And uh, I love to entertain, and uh, I do a lot of repeat business, you know, with the same groups, organizations. Mm-hmm. And they keep me quite busy, and I enjoy it tremendously. How, did you do a show today? Yes, this afternoon, yes. I work a lot of these uh, assisted living places. I see. And I was in Quincy, Massachusetts this afternoon. At the uh, Town Brook House doing the, old, Brookhouse, days, yeah. Lovely doing the place. old days of radio. Yeah, yeah, I did my old-time radio show for them. They're a wonderful audience. I'm usually there every year at around this time. And, of course, I, you know, I vary the shows, I vary the programs whenever mm-hmm. I'm there. So for our listeners, let's uh, spin a little bit of uh, theater of the mind. When when you are doing one of your programs, what are what are one of your programs, your shows like? Well, it depends on the show. It depends on the show. Uh, for example, I do a show called Everything's Coming Up Irish. And this show consists of Irish music. I'm an accordionist. It consi- consists of Irish jokes that are clean. And it consists of Irish trivia, for which I give out prizes. And again, I constantly intertwine those three things. And it's a lot of fun. You don't have to be Irish to uh, enjoy that show. <laughs> well, once a year, everybody's Irish, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and it's one of my one of my personal favorites, uh, the the Irish show. Now I, I noticed mean, in the, go ahead. I was going to say I do a whole bunch of video shows. I bring That's all the video equipment. Ask. I do a show called The Golden Days of Television. I do a show called The Golden Days of Rock and Roll. Everybody from, uh, I start with Bill Haley and the Comets, and I wind up with the Beatles. I do two shows on the big bands. One is one is called The Big Bands, where I show 15 of the great big band leaders. And the other one is called The Big Band Singers. So I have a lot of fun with those video shows. And I kind of vary the program to uh, to accommodate the audience. So what do you do? Do you, you play some video and talk and then... Yeah, between each one. 
Yeah, between each each cut, for example, I'll play uh, I'll play Glenn Miller and talk about him. I'll play Benny Goodman, Harry James, Guy Lombardo. Uh, and remember, this is a video show, and I tell little stories and anecdotes about each one between each cut. So even though it is video, I really make it a show. Well, since you've heard some uh, Glenn Miller music here on our program, what would be a typical kind of an anecdote that you might tell about Glenn Miller? You could share this. Well, the the sad thing, you know, if you would ask most people who sold the most, what band leaders sold the most records, the typical answer would be Glenn Miller. Everybody would say that when I throw that question out. But the thing that people forget is that he was only a band leader for eight years, died in that terrible plane crash. He was flying from uh, England to France or France to England, I don't remember. And uh, he, he died in the plane crash. Um, would you like to take a guess? What band leader do you think sold the most records? Oh, gosh. Um, big band music is just not one of those things I have a real grasp on. I mean, I, w- I would just be guessing Harry James. That's a very good guess. Many people would guess Benny Goodman. Many people would guess Tommy Dorsey. But Horace Welk, not, maybe? No, no, not on record. On TV, he had the most, okay. the longest longevity. But uh, Guy Lombardo, who was a band leader for 50 years, wow. he has sold the most records of any band leader. The sweetest music this side of heaven. Gosh, I, I remember a time when New Year's Eve just wasn't New Year's Eve without Guy Lombardo. That's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. When he passed away, he took good music with him. He was a fixture for 50 years, first on radio, and then it was simulcast on radio and television, and then just television. But for 50 years, he ushered in New Year's Eve. Since uh, last Friday night, we had uh, Brian Gary on, whose grandfather was uh, Eddie Cantor. What, uh, what, what anecdotal stories can you share with us about Eddie Cantor? Eddie Cantor was a very, very giving man. If anybody needed him for a benefit or uh, some sort of testimonial, he was always there. In the mid-40s, with the assistant, this is on his radio show, with the assistant of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he started something called the March of Dimes, Mm -hmm. where he asked each one of his listeners to send in one dime to help fight infantile paralysis. And it's amazing, from all these people that sent in one dime, they raised millions and millions of dollars and ultimately found the cure for polio. Cantor was also great about giving unknown people their start in show business. Uh, Diana Durbin was a protege of his, Bobby Breen, Georgie Jessel, Eddie Cantor, and perhaps the most popular of all the people he started was Dinah Shore. And most of those names I mentioned uh, eventually became major stars. Uh, Brian Gary was sharing with us uh, last Friday night that when he would uh, go out to California uh, during the summer vacations as a, as a child to stay with his grandfather, his grandfather did not have a swimming pool. So he would call up some of his pals and say, you know, like, I got the grandkids over. Can they come over and swim in your pool? So Brian Gary had the opportunity to swim in the swimming pools of uh, Groucho Marx uh, and uh, Dinah Shore and there were a few others I didn't quite remember but uh, I thought that was pretty neat now he said uh, he didn't he was just a kid there in the house and he didn't oh, remember yeah. seeing them but you know he, had, you, he, has the, great... he, has, he can say I swam in Groucho's pool <laughs> yeah that's great his mother Janet Janet uh, Cantagary is um, the youngest of Eddie's five five daughters and she, when she was growing up in uh, in California, they lived next to George Gershwin. And and Janet was telling me she remembers sitting on George Gershwin's front steps, listening to him compose the Rhapsody in Blue. Oh. How's oh, that wow. for memory? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she also spoke about many of the people that would visit the uh, Cantor household, people she loved, people she hated. She loved Jack Benny. She loved uh, Danny Thomas. She loved Danny Kay. I said to her, well, who didn't you like? She said, there were only two people I didn't care for. One was Al Jolson, and the other was Groucho Marx. 
I huh. said, well, why didn't you like either one? She said they were both very nasty, a lot of four-letter words. And we were little girls, and they scared the heck out of us. Huh. But the, the Cantor household was a who's who of celebrities that came over to visit on many an occasion. Yeah. That's what Brian said, that, that um, these were just his grandpa's friends. And from his perspective as a little kid, uh, they, a lot of them were just these old people that would come over, you know. Absolutely. J- Jana would make a great guest on, on your show. Hmm. She has wonderful yeah. stories, wonderful anecdotes. You ought to consider her as a guest. We may well do that. She's a doll. You've got 10 books to your credit. Are you working on more? Yeah. Yeah, I'm almost done. I'm working on a uh, I'm working on a book called The Comedian's Trivia Book. And I'm doing every form of comedy from stand-up to radio to television to movies. And the book is almost done and it's loaded with uh with pictures, uh, especially autographed pictures of famous comedians that I've uh, I've emceed over the years. So I'm very excited about this next book. Would you like it's to drop a few names? Away. You want to drop a few names of those comedians that you've emceed oh, for? Oh, sure. Oh, yes, of course. See, I used to be the MC of the resort in the Catskill Mountains, the Brickman Hotel. So I uh, got to MC many of these great comedians. Uh, off the top of my head, Milton Burrow, Rodney Dangerfield, Henny oh, Youngman, boy. Maury Amsterdam, Pat Cooper, Jack Carter. It's kind of a who's who of great comedians of the past. Yeah. And comedy has changed, I don't have to tell you, Scott. It's all oh, I know, Roger, I know. full letter words now. The great old comedians never had to resort to this type of material to entertain an audience. Well, I'm I'm not a prude, and, and I know all the words, and I know how to use them, and when sure. to use them, etc. But uh, you know, it was uh, George Carlin one time made the point in an interview that you know it's not about saying the words, uh, it's about knowing when to say them for the proper effect. That's good. And, I, I and totally a lot agree. Of, and a lot of the young comedians don't seem to understand that. They just no. seem to think that exactly. if you say a word, that that's really funny, and it's not. Exactly. Uh, uh, some some that will come on stage immediately and start using four letter words with no rhyme or reason, but to some of the younger people in the audience will laugh like it's the funniest thing they've ever yeah. seen. So comedy has changed, but unfortunately not for the better. One of the most unfunny th- programs I ever saw, uh, well I've seen recently that I thought was going to be funny was the uh, the time that they roasted uh, Bill Shatner, William Shatner, Captain Kirk. Oh yeah, yeah. And it was on DVD, and I watched it, and this it was just wasn't funny, and we gave up on it. The profanity was unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that was the friars that roasted. I used to go to a lot of the friars roasts. Milton Berle used to get me in, and they were so funny. But the roast now, it's a, you can't use a sentence without a full letter word. No. And that's no. what has happened, unfortunately, to today's comedy. Well, fortunately for comedy of the past, we have YouTube, and I have I have many times spent the evening entertaining you know myself here in front of my computer by finding old Johnny Carson programs and yeah. and Jack Bar Jack Car Jack uh, Jack Parr Par. Jack Parr programs and on and on and on. It's really terrific. So they were the best. That's, that's why I pre- when I found when I saw your books, I I said. Got to have them on because I, I just love that stuff. It's really a lot of fun. Thank so, you. Me too. Thank you. Thank you for all the things that you're doing and, and keeping this stuff going. Well, thank you, Scott. I enjoy doing your show. Like, likewise. And we'll do it again sometime. Thanks. That's our first hour. Mel Simons is our guest, and you can keep up with Mel's work at melsimons.net. His uh, exhaustive schedule. This, this guy works all the time, and we'll be right back. <laughs> 